Okay, um, so let's get back to what we were doing last time. Um, we were talking about um, putting these charges that have this desire to go to lower potential energy and putting them to good use. So instead of just getting to keep that energy when they lose potential energy, just getting to go faster and keep it as kinetic energy, we instead make the charges burrow through an insulating bridge. So here's what we have again, just to remind you of the situation. We have one conductor. Conductors are equipotentials. potentials. So this entire thing is at one voltage. It's like a voltage plateau. And down here we have another conductor. So this is also a voltage plateau. So that's all the same voltage, but the two plateaus are not the same. In other words, we have, this is a higher voltage uh, than this one. So we have basically two plateaus where um, if we give away to go back and forth between them, um, we will have movement of charge. So what's really happening? It's an electron, a free electron, which goes from lower voltage to higher voltage. We learned electrons like to go to higher voltage. But instead of being able to take its potential energy and just go faster, convert it to kinetic energy, it instead goes to heat. And the reason why is this dodging around a bunch of stuff in the insulator, and of course, it imparts the energy to those things that it bumped into, okay? Now you could say, well, heat is just also kind of like a kinetic energy, but it's like more diffuse kinetic energy. It's when everything just kind of jiggles around more, right? So we have that a higher temperature is achieved. Um, so uh, that's what we're going to look at more today and start to build circuits. Before uh, we do that, let me give you a little bit of a, a historical quirk. This is still thanks to uh, Ben Franklin here. Um, what's really happening is, is that free electrons are seeking higher voltage, but we pretend that it's positive charges seeking lower voltage. Okay. So now that we have the benefit of hindsight to understand what's going on in, on the atomic level, we understand that the electrons have mobility. And the whole reason, of course, why electrons got their minus sign in the first place is people didn't know that for a long time. And so even to this day, even though we know better, we often visualize that electrical flow is the movement of positive charges to lower voltage, even though it's really electrons going to higher voltage. Now you might question, isn't that going to cause some kind of error in our thinking if we're imagining things are going exactly the wrong way? But it turns out it doesn't. Because if this energy is just going to turn to heat anyway, it doesn't really matter. I guess I'll draw some uh, heat lines or something. So this is going to get hot. It's just going to diffuse the energy out to the world. So first the energy goes into the, making the atoms in the insulating bridge jiggle around faster, and then they'll release it. Does it really matter which direction something moves if it's just going to get released indiscriminately the heat? Okay, it's like when you're rubbing your hands together for warmth. Does it matter if you're rubbing your hands together like this for warmth, or like this together for warmth? Does it matter, right? Or you can go like this. So it actually turns out in many applications, it does not hurt us whatsoever to imagine positive charge as being the charge carrier, even though it's actually totally wrong. It's not actually the case uh, here. And of course, you can imagine that if we imagine uh, the positive charge, positives are always easier to deal with, right? So we imagine it as positive charge carriers. So again, what's really going on in electrical flow it's electrons seeking higher voltage, but we pretend that it's positive charge seeking lower voltage. Now, we don't generally call them positive, those positive charges protons, simply because that's, there's no actual protons moving. The protons are the things that are held in place in the nucleus when you're talking about a solid, right? So if you want to call them something, you can just call them positive charge carriers, okay? 
Does that make sense? So they're hypothetical positive charge carriers that don't actually exist. Um, and the reason I mention this is that we're going to very sh uh, shortly define a quantity called electric current. <clears throat> An electric current is actually set in the direction of these hypothetical positive charge carriers. <clears throat> so it's this weird thing that we do. It's all historical fluke, right? If we saw a river, we would all agree that the river flows downhill, right? Okay? And if we had a bunch of ducks in the river, we could say the ducks are all going downstream, right? In this case, uh, we are choosing to instead say the absence of ducks is going upstream, right? So what's really going on and what we say is going on are completely opposite, but it doesn't hurt us in any way. You just kind of have to get over that weirdness, okay? So uh, let me try to show you a little bit of a demo on this. Um, I'm going to have uh, these little uh, um, kind of metal balls standing in for these hypothetical positive charge carriers. And this thing right here is going to be a stand-in for that insulating bridge. So these nails, obviously, are going to get in the way. Um, so there's a big difference between dropping something out in free space, where its potential energy gets compared to kinetic energy, right? So it falls faster. But if I drop one of these down, we're going to find that Basically, its speed never has a chance to increase. It basically comes out the bottom the same speed it went in the top, right? The reason why is because it collided with things on the way down. This is kind of like if you ever watched The Price is Right, there's a Plinko game, right? So you try to get, you know, cash prize slot down here somewhere. So the idea is, is that you lose the energy, the potential energy all goes into heat instead from these collisions. So this is basically what electrical flow is like. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. And we're going to put that heat to good use. Oh, and there's one stuck in there. Obviously, that doesn't really happen in electrical flow. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is just going to work out the details of this today. Um, and uh, let's, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, First of all, this big construction thing, this is uh, not how we're going to draw it. I'm going to draw these two conductors like this. So one of those represents the higher voltage, one represents the lower voltage. Um, the one that's drawn longer is understood to be the higher voltage. Okay? So this is the higher voltage, and this is the lower voltage. This is what is called a battery. A battery is basically someone is handing you some kind of device where it has two voltage plateaus, a higher and a lower. And rather than the charges going directly from one to the other, you actually want to be able to have the charge go through some kind of insulating bridge. And that is called a resistor. In fact, this right here is the electrical symbol for it to kind of represent what happened in there. It's kind of bouncing around. They're not literally shaped like that. They're shaped like cylinders, usually. But it's just a way of drawing. So they look like that. And usually we use some wires to connect them. So this is going to be our very first electric circuit. It has a battery. It has what's called a resistor. That is where the electric potential energy is going to be converted into heat. And I guess you could throw in, I guess it has wires in it, although I'll talk about the fact that the wires really don't add much going on. Um, so first of all, let me give you some uh, background. The higher voltage and the lower voltage, how do you tell which one is which? Well, they're labeled usually. Um, the higher voltage is often painted red, of course you could paint it any color you want, but someone's trying to be nice and use some kind of convention, and the lower voltage is painted black, okay? If you ever see 
a battery where one terminal is painted purple and the other one is orange. I have no idea what's going on there. Someone's just trying to mess with you. The whole point of these is that they're conventions that you can just walk up and see, okay? Another way that they're commonly labeled is the, the higher voltage terminal is labeled plus and the lower voltage is labeled minus. Um, that one I don't particularly like. Um, we of course know that positive charges make higher voltage or voltage hills and negative charges make voltage valleys or lower voltage. So that's kind of a way to symbolize that this is higher than this. But the really the important thing is that there's a voltage difference. Okay? What I mentioned here is that they can both be positively charged, it's just this one has to be more positively charged. So there would be no difference if you, instead of labeling them plus or minus, you could label this plus plus and this plus. Okay? The important thing is there's the difference. That's the only thing that's going to uh, matter. And the voltage difference um, between these two, uh, the magnitude of it usually gets a special character. It's called the EMF. It just helps when we get into more complicated situations to make sure that we set aside a special character for the voltage difference set by the battery. Okay? So if you have a 9 volt battery, that means that one terminal is higher than the other by 9 volts. We might say the EMF is 9 volts. Okay? So, um, let's now look at the resistor. Um, well, I guess before I do that, let me mention that uh, I should look at the wire. Now the wire basically is also a conductor. So if I took, for instance, this conductor here and I added another piece of metal to it, that would just extend the plateau. That would just be all part of this conductor. And a conductor is entirely an active potential. So really, the wire allows you to extend the plateau all the way up to the beginning of the resistor. So wires, ideal wires, are basically just going to be allow you to extend an equipotential region to some other place. And same thing over here. The lower voltage, if you attach a conducting piece of wire to it, it just extends the equipotential plateau of the lower voltage all the way up to the other edge of the resistor. And so what you can see here is that the only place where you can make, sustain that voltage difference is across the resistor, right? So the resistor, because it's an insulating bridge, it does not automatically equalize out the two plateaus. In fact, it lets charge trickle through it, and in process of doing so, uh, finds a, a lower potential energy uh, and turns it into heat, okay? Um, so, we're going to take a look at the details today of what happens with this resistor. So, first things first, um, I guess let's go ahead and um, talk about the relationship. Uh, I guess let's introduce electrical current first. So electric current, I already mentioned it a little bit, but let's define it more formally. We use the letter I as the variable for electric current. Electric current is exactly what you think it would be. It's the amount of charge that flows per time. Right? It's like how you, if you wanted to define river current, right? you'd talk about water per time flowing past. Well, it's, this is charge per time. Um, the units of, of current would then be uh, coulombs per second, right? It's how many coulombs flow by you per second. Um, this gets its own name. I'll tell you the full name, which no one ever uses. It's called an ampere. Uh, everyone just calls it an amp. Okay, so one amp of current means one coulomb is delivered per second. As you can imagine, that's kind of a lot of current, right? We talked about a coulomb being a lot of charge. So if you have one coulomb of charge delivered per second, that's a lot. So in lab, I assure you, if you are reading one amp of current, you should ask your instructor, 
Don't touch it and ask your instructor, why is my current so high? Okay, we're going to be more, more working in milliamps. Okay, so that's a more safe amount of current. And I guess I should mention, if you want to abbreviate it, you can also use A. So that's what an ampere is. One amp is the amount of electrical current such that one coulomb flows by per second. Um, the other thing that I've already mentioned, I'll reiterate, we take the direction of the electrical current, so the direction of the flow, as being the hypothetical movement of positive charge from higher voltage, which it doesn't like, to lower voltage, which it does. Okay? And again, I mention that because it's opposite is what's really happening. So this is the direction of the electrical current. I guess I can put here direction of I, since I already talked about um, what the variable is. But really, it's electrons going the other way. Okay. So this is the convention we're stuck with. We're going to continue to use it. All right. So that's electrical current. So let's talk about um, the relationships between uh, electrical current and this voltage difference that we're applying across the ends of the resistor. So this comes up with something called Ohm's law, which is going to be the topic of your next lab, I believe. Um, so let me write down what Ohm's law is. Um, I guess I'll redraw this circuit a little bit. Law. Oh, um, and even before I do that, there's one piece of notation that I have to tell you about. Okay, so we're going to make a notation change from homework three and beyond. And I, I'm mentioning this very explicitly because if I don't tell you this, it's incredibly confusing. Okay. So if we want to talk about the magnitude of the voltage difference from one place to another. Now I've already, and uh, I think it was a lecture or two ago, I really made a, a big stink about the fact that only voltage differences matter, right? If you want to call over here uh, 9 volts and 0 volts, there's no substantive difference if you instead it's 109 and 100. As long as the voltage difference is the same, there's no practical difference. And in circuits, we really start to acknowledge that. We only start to talk about voltage differences. What's the difference in voltage between here and here? Okay, that's the only thing we ever talk about. We don't ever care to start assigning voltage values to particular locations. I know that's what homework number two is all about. But even on homework two, there are a couple questions where it says, the voltage difference between here and here is this. And you'll find you're perfectly capable of solving the problem, even though you don't necessarily know anything about the values at each place, you only know their difference. So here's what we're going to do. Starting with homework number three, we start to call the difference in voltage between two locations, we call that V. It's like designed to be confused, okay? So in homework number two, if someone says the voltage is nine volts, what it means is that this location has a voltage of nine volts. But homework three, when someone says nine volts, what they mean is that the voltage difference between this place and this place is nine volts. Okay? Now, I know that's horribly confusing, but it's almost universally used, so I have to use this too. I could shield you in this class by always writing magnitude of delta V, but it would not help when you go out in the real world. Okay, so let's do it. This is our notational change, okay? So, Ohm's Law, let me write down what it is. Ohm's Law is our first law where V means the difference in voltage from one place to the other. Okay? So this is the voltage difference, and again, remember, it's just, it just says V, but it's a voltage difference between the ends of the resistor. That's what that is. So it's how, much, how different is the voltage on one end from the voltage on the other end. 
Now, I loosely like to describe this term as the motivation, okay? This is what sets up the motivation for any charge to want to burrow through this obstruction, is it has something that is going to happen to its advantage, right? Positive charges seek lower voltage. Why do they do that? Why would they go through some horrible obstruction to do that? It's because there's an energy advantage to doing that. It's the same reason why, why would a ball fall through all these nails? It's because there's an energy advantage to going through this gauntlet and going out the other side. So that's what the voltage difference provides. It provides a motivation, an energy motivation to go from through this thing. This thing here is the electrical current. That's how much charge actually flows. So this is the what happens. Okay. And the last ingredient is a way of rating just how easy or difficult is this particular obstruction to get through. So this is what's called the electrical resistance. It's basically a rating of difficulty of getting through this obstruction, okay? So not everything is equally difficult. Some things are more difficult, they have a higher electrical resistance, some things are easier to get through, they have a lower electrical resistance. So this equation, basically if we take out the specifics that are uh, obviously electrical in nature, the equation is motivation equals what happens times difficulty. This equation applies to circuits, this equation applies to real life, okay? So let's take a little bit of a spin around this equation, right? So let's take something where we fix one of the variables and we see how the other two relate, okay? So let's have a fixed amount of motivation, okay? So we're going to fix amount of motivation. So let's say everybody in this room is equally motivated in their studies, all right? Well, let's look at the other two. The product of these two has to be a fixed number, okay? So if we take a bunch of students that are equally motivated and we put them into a very difficult class, okay? Students are gonna do more poorly. If we put them into an easy class, they do better, right? So if we have a large difficulty, not as much happens. If we have a low difficulty, then more will happen, right? I'm sure you guys all have your classes on some, there's some class that you're taking where you're like, oh, I know I don't have to work as hard for this class as for physics, okay? I need some of those classes, right? So, because it's more difficult, it's harder to, to get things done, right? Does that make sense? Okay, and likewise, if we have a fixed voltage difference, but we put a very large obstruction, the current is going to be a relatively small trickle. But if we take a fixed amount of motivation to go through the resistor, and the resistor is really quite manageable, low amount of uh, resistance, we get a whole torrent of charge that's going to go through there for time, a large current, okay? Kind of rush of charge. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's let, let uh, one of these other variables be fixed. Let's let the resistance be fixed. So we'll take something of a fixed amount of difficulty, okay? So if you have something of a fixed amount of difficulty, you don't have very much motivation to do it, what's going to happen to the, the how much is going to happen, a lot or a little? So if, B, if R is fixed and B is small, what happens to I? Small. But if you take the exact same resistance and you give someone a lot of motivation, suddenly it's happening, okay? So I'll give you an example of this, okay? 
Let's take something of fixed difficulty, like say, uh, eating a live cockroach, okay? So you go around and you ask people, hey, I'll give you $5 if you eat this, okay? So that's not very much uh, motivation to get $5. So you'll probably find very few people that'll take you up on that. But there are whole television shows that are based on the premise that you give them something really difficult, like eating a live cockroach, and you can have the chance of winning a million dollars it's disturbing how many people eat a cockroach, right? So the whole reality show is based around this concept, right? Okay, so that's the essence of Ohm's Law. Okay, we're weighing these three things against each other. What's the motivation? The voltage difference across the ends. And how difficult it is to get through there? And the third ingredient is what actually happens, okay? This, in essence, is what you'll be doing in your Ohm's Law lab is you will take a resistor, a fixed amount of difficulty to move through, and you will gradually increase the motivation to go across it. You'll increase the voltage drop across the ends, and you will find more and more current flows. In fact, you'll find that they have a direct relationship. So you'll find that if you double the voltage, you'll double the current. If you triple the voltage, you'll triple the current. And you guys are going to make a graph of this. And basically, when you measure the slope, it's going to be the resistance, okay? And then you're going to swap out in another different resistance and measure that, and you're going to get, be able to get a bunch of resistance values and things like that, okay? That is the essence, okay? Um, if you want a little bit more uh, guidance there, your resistance is like this. You will connect it to a power supply. That power supply, you can have a knob that varies the voltage, so you can apply different voltages. You put a measurement device called a voltmeter. The voltmeter looks like this. You basically put one prong on the one end and one prong on the other end, and then it'll just measure the amount of voltage difference there is across the ends, right? You need to put one on one end and one on the other. And then as far as the current goes, you measure current just like you would current in a river. Um, what you do is, of course, if you want to count water flowing past, you either, like you can say, maybe you have a bridge upstream or a bridge downstream, you can count the amount of water passing under the bridge, right? So, just before or just after the current enters the resistor, you have this device called an ammeter, because I guess amp meter is too awkward to say. That counts it. You can put it just before or just after. But point being is that um, you have to count the charge either on its way in or on its way out. I, I guess I should mention that in your lab, I think you might even put it over here. Because of course, there's nowhere for it to really go. So you can put it anywhere along this thing. Um, these, by the way, these are devices called voltmeters and ammeters. I'll come back to this uh, and talk about how they work a little bit more carefully uh, um, in the future. But just wanted to give you a general idea of how you do this. Okay. Um, so, what do we have? Um, I guess the one piece of um, information that we have yet to discuss is um, the units for electrical resistance. So the units, of course, have to all line up. So what's the units of uh, V? Joules per coulomb? Well, trick question. It's V, right? That's why we call it voltage, because it's volts, right? And we talked about the um, current. What's the unit for that again? Amps. So we can solve for the units of electrical resistance are volt per amp. That gets a name. It's called an ohm. That's the Greek letter omega. Okay. It's named after a guy whose last name happened to be Ohm, and so they obviously are going to use the Greek letter that sounds like his name, right? Omega. Okay, it looks like a horseshoe. So what is an Ohm? An Ohm is the amount of electrical resistance that will allow for one volt of motivation, one amp of current. Okay? 
So if you have something that has an electrical resistance of one ohm, that means that the obstruction for one volt of, one volt of motivation will allow one amp of current. Okay? If you think about the numbers, you can imagine that one ohm of resistance is actually not very much because one volt of motivation is not that much, but one amp, allowing one amp of current, that's a lot. It's a huge torrent. So for relatively little motivation, we get a lot of current. So one ohm is a relatively small amount of resistance. Okay. Um, are there any questions so far? Okay, um, so I guess I should tell you um, something about the internal workings of a resistor. So what is it that makes it some, one resistor uh, one ohm and another one a million ohms? There's obviously something about this thing that's change is different objects that make them different resistances. This is just a way of rating that resistance, but let's see what goes into that. So what determines the resistance of something? Okay. Well, it depends on the thing itself. So let's say I have a cylindrical shape. I have some cylindrical hunk of material, and it has a higher voltage on one end and a lower voltage on one end. Electrical current will go through it from high to low. So what is it determines exactly how difficult it is for something to burrow through there? Well, let me just tell you the formula. So L is the length of the travel that you have to burrow through this material, right? And hopefully it doesn't surprise you that if you have a longer way to go, that's harder. It makes your trip harder, so the resistance goes up. So the gauntlet is longer, it's going to be a harder journey. Okay? A is the cross-sectional area. So that would be this. If it's a circle, or uh, if it's a cylinder, then the cross-sectional area is circular, so you might use pi r squared. If it's a, if it's a rectangular block, cross-sectional area would be a rectangle, right? So length times width, so those are different options, right? But the point being is that if the cross-sectional in in increases, then you can see in the equation that's going to because the A is in the denominator, then R is going to decrease. So if this is, makes the gauntlet longer, this makes it wider. And hopefully you can see that making it wider should actually make the job easier, right? The charges, when they're trying to burrow through there, it's not like some narrow bottleneck. It's kind of uh, many lanes, right? When you're stuck in traffic on the highway, you hope that there's another lane coming up, right? Make it wider, make it easier, okay? So those are the physical dimensions. How long is the gauntlet and how wide is the gauntlet? And then, of course, there's got to be something that accounts for different materials, because in different materials, those atoms might be really closely spaced and hard to get by or, or not. So that's where this comes in. This is to account for the various materials. So this thing right here is called the resistivity. And this is the resistivity of the particular material you are working with. So this is just the physical property that's assigned based on what you're working with. The units of this will actually be ohm meters. You can work it out based on the, um, the equation there. So just let me give you some examples um, of values. Um, I think there's, um, I don't remember if there's any on your equation sheet, but if there isn't, I would of course give it to you in the problem. Question? Does that symbol have a name? Oh yeah, that's rho, okay. Uh, this is the Greek letter rho, it's like a rounded off P. Um, some of you may have seen it before for density, but this is definitely not density. 
Okay. Um, so um, let me grab some example values. Um, so I actually think I mentioned resistivity before. Um, this whole idea of conductors and insulators being separate categories was really not correct. It's convenient for learning about them at first, but of course the annoying thing about physics is that every time it seems like something's in easy, this or that, there's a, it depends, okay? So in nature many things are continuous. We think of conductor and insulator as two separate bins, but in fact there's a whole continuum of behavior between them, and we use resistivity to rate that behavior, okay? So an ideal conductor, which again is like the unicorn or the free lunch, doesn't really exist, okay? An ideal conductor has zero electrical resistivity, which means that it has no resistance Right? So there's absolutely no impediment. Those electrons are free to go and do what they please. This is not possible in real life, in everyday life. I should mention it actually is possible if you go down cold enough. Then you get to something called superconductors, and they truly have no electrical resistivity at all. Okay? But it doesn't happen in everyday life because your te our temperatures are too high. Okay? You don't need some super cooling agent to get to this. An ideal insulator has a resistivity of infinity, which is to say that it, it has electrical resistance that is so high that it does not allow any mobility, which is of course what we said, right? Is we said that in an insulator these electrons are bound, right? They're, they're beholden to their nucleus so they can't flow, right? Well, the reality is, is that everything is somewhere in between, okay? There are things, there are atoms that are more beholden to their electrons, and there are ones that are less. If you have a material where it, they have a relatively weak grip on their electrons, it doesn't take much for them to all go, hey, let's go over here. Whereas if you have one that has a relatively strong grip on its electrons, when other electrons are trying to sneak through, they're, of course, encountering all sorts of obstacles. So let me give you some typical values. So for instance, like a copper might be over here. So for instance, copper has a value of somewhere around 1.72 times 10 to the minus 8 ohm meters. Okay. Um, versus, we might have a Carbon, I'm not sure exactly what configuration this is, but uh, of carbon this is, but it might be of somewhere around 3.5 times 10 to the minus fifth ohmmeters. Now those numbers to individually, of course, uh, don't have any strong thing, but I want to point out that just by being carbon instead of copper, we're talking about a 2,000 fold increase in the resistivity. Which means that if all else was the same, right, we had exactly the same size or chunk of these two, same length, same cross-sectional area, just by virtue of being different materials, their resistances are going to be vastly different. And so, over here, we might choose to say that the copper and carbon are on kind of different places on the continuum. And so for, to make our problem easier, in reality, the whole path through, so the entire electrical flow, it'll counter materials of where it's easier to go through and materials where it's harder to go through. So we just basically decide in a problem how we're going to cleave the two bins. Right? We decide that these things are going to be conductors, and we're not going to worry about them, 
And these things are going to be insulators, and we are going to worry about them. So these are going to be like our wires, which basically we pretend are equipotentials. The amount of electrical resistance added by them are relative, is relatively negligible. And then these are going to be our special resistors. So it's kind of like what we're doing is we have, we're pretending that we have two voltage plateaus and then we have a resistor where you can transition between them, okay? But in reality, it's probably more like this. It costs you something to go through a wire, so you do lose a little voltage. Then you do most of the dropping through the resistors and then, of course, your journey through the wire, you have a little bit of drop as well, okay? You can't even go through a wire for free. Okay, because even a wire does cost you a little bit. And if, it, if it's not a perfect conductor, you need to save some of your motivation for going through the wire. Okay? So this is what we pretend. This is what we pretend for expediency. But this is what really happens. There's a slight drop off in the wires and voltage because they have some resistance. They need some motivation to finish, start going through the wire and finish. Um, but we pretend that we basically are going through a series of plateaus with resistors connecting them, okay? This, the only reason I bring this up is because you might be wondering, if a charge is on a plateau like this, how does it even know that it should be doing something? Well, how does it know to, that, to go over here? Well, in reality, it's always going to lower voltage. It's just how precipitously is it going uh, in doing that. Um, are there any questions on that? Okay, and so the final thing I do want to mention is that in most problems you do not need to compute the resistance like this. You didn't, you're not given, oh here's what it's made out of and here's its length and area, find the resistance and then do something with it. Most problems they just give you this. Hey, someone dug in a box and they gave you a resistor that is labeled 10 ohms. And then you just use it, okay? And in lab, you'll learn that instead of just having, say, 10 ohms written on the side, there's this color band system. So you read the color bands and those tell you what the resistance is. The manufacturer has made this and then they've conveyed the information about, Okay, they're not necessarily going to tell you exactly what's in there, what's the secret sauce. They're not going to tell you the exact dimensions, but they are going to tell you, here's the resistance of this thing that you can put in an electric circuit, okay? Okay, so that's a little bit about resistance. And we have one more order of business before we go ahead and just start building circuits. Um, so here's what we have so far. We have Ohm's Law. If necessary, we can compute the resistance of something by just knowing about its physical construction. Um, but we also mentioned, of course, that uh, the essential function of what a resistor does is it converts electric potential energy to heat. So let's find uh, a way to quantify that. Okay. So um, I want to know about the particulars of how the potential energy gets converted into heat. Let's work it out. Well, um, the amount of potential energy that change that you will experience will be how much charge you have flowing through a particular voltage difference, right? That's basically just good old PE equals QV applied to delta form. And I don't know why I used the capital Q. I guess let me just go ahead and use a lowercase Q, okay? So there it is, right? That's the amount of potential energy we lost. It's going to be Q times the voltage difference that it went through. Okay? All right? Now here's the thing. The amount, total amount of energy is a kind of a silly quantity to talk about. If you flip on a light bulb, it's always spitting out energy. There's more energy, more energy, more energy, more energy. This amount would just increase gradually. The amount of energy released depends on have you had the light on for second or all day, right? The amount of energy released will be different. 
A more interesting question is to ask about what's the rate of energy release per time. So we should probably divide by time to get a rate, right? So this is the rate at which energy is converted, okay? So a better question is the rate of conversion. Now, there is a quantity from Physics 1 which is, talks about the rate at which work is done or the rate at which energy is converted. Does anyone remember what that's called? Power? Power. So this is going to be labeled P. This is the power dissipated by the resistor. And again, what does power mean? Uh, well, this is the uh, um, energy, the rate at which energy is converted. It's converted from potential energy to heat, of course. And the power dissipated is this rate. That's what we call it. The reason why we call it dissipated is because we like to think of the energy as kind of dispersing, right? It's going from being contained in the charges to just kind of being sent out to the environment as heat. So the resistor heats up and then it releases that energy to heat to the environment. Let's work on the other side. Of course, we already said we were going to call delta V just V. Okay, we're leaving the delta V behind. And we can also recognize that Q per T is what? What's the amount of charge flow per time? Current. Current, exactly. So we've got our formula. P equals IV. So if you want to know the amount of uh, the rate of energy conversion from potential energy to heat, you need to multiply the electrical current by the voltage difference it is flowing through. If you want to look at the units, it makes a lot of sense. This is the energy lost per time. And when I say lost, of course, I don't mean it's destroyed. I mean it's converted into heat. Okay. So and then loss to the environment is heat. Okay. The energy lost per time, well, current is just the, uh, how much charge flows per time. That's the definition of current. And then voltage, remember that's the motivation, right? Voltage, let me remind you, volt is just a joule per coulomb. So that's energy per time. So a volt is a joule per coulomb. That means that this is energy lost per time. I'm oh, sorry, energy loss per charge. So we're multiplying how much charge flows per time, that's the total number of charge carriers that are moving through the system per time, and we're multiplying it by how much energy is lost by each one. And you can see the charge is really just the middleman, right? we do wind up with total energy loss per time. It's the charges that are doing it, right? So that means, of course, that you can lose the same amount of energy per time either because you have a relatively small amount of charge flow, but every single charge is losing a lot of energy, right? Or, vice versa, you can have a very hefty flow with a lot of current, but each one is only losing a little bit of energy. You can wind up with the same amount of total energy loss or energy conversion to heat per time several different ways. You can either have a lot of charges losing a little bit of energy or a little a few charges losing a lot of energy each, right? Does that make sense? So that's our power law formula. I'm going to add it to the list here. And I'm also going to give you two alternative formulas for power loss. Um, and I'm going to do that simply by subbing in Ohm's law. So for instance, um, I could sub in for V, V is I R, so it would be I times I times R, so I squared R. 
So that would be another way to get the uh, power loss or the energy loss. Um, or I could, for instance, instead um, let the uh, current take a break. So let me substitute in here. Instead of getting rid of the voltage, let me get rid of the current. So I'll plug in I from Ohm's law as V over R. So uh, V over R times V, that's V squared over R. So this is three alternate forms of the power law. Each of them has two of the variables, there's three variables, V, I, and R, and each of them lets two of those uh, feature while the third one takes a break. Okay? So this one has I and V, this one has I and R, and this is V and R. Okay? Now, um, you might question why I would want to prep three forms of this uh, to have laying around. Uh, we're going to see when the circuits get more complicated, it's really nice to have any one of those three to choose from, because some may be more intuitive than others. Okay? Um, so, that right there forms the basis of our, our simple kind of circuit stuff. Let's just go ahead and, uh, and do that. Uh, oh, and the other thing I did, it looks like I forgot to mention, um, does anyone remember what's the units of uh, power? Watts. Watts, that's right. So it's energy loss per time, joules per second. That gets called a watt. So you may be uh, aware, for instance, a light bulb during those watts, right? So you have your own incandescent 100 watt light bulb, right? That means it takes 100 joules of electric potential energy converts it into heat and light per second. And a 100 watt light bulb is going to be brighter than a 50 watt light bulb because a 50 watt light bulb only does 50 joules of conversion per second. Now the thing that confuses this is that um, these old incandescent light bulbs, the way they worked was by brute force. They were just heated something up so much that it happened to glow. Okay? So these old light bulbs, for instance, um, really you'd have 90 watts going into heat, and maybe 10 watts, if you were lucky, actually going into visible light. If you've ever accidentally touched an incandescent light bulb, you will not forget that. They are extremely hot. Most of the energy there is wasted, actually. So 90 watts is kind of waste product, right? It's all well and good if you want it to function as a dual heater slash light, right? So I remember in my, you know, one of my old uh, crappy apartments, right? If it was the windows leaked in the middle of the winter, one of the ways we could, the heat didn't work very well, so we just turn on all the lights in the house, okay? But it is very wasteful if you are simultaneously air conditioning your house, right? So this is hence the big move to these more energy efficient bulbs, right? And then for me, an old timer like me, I'm trying to go into the, the store and read the boxes and it, the numbers don't mean anything to me anymore. I go and I read and it says on the box, 10 watts as bright as an old 100 watt, right? But there's a little fine print there on the bottom for people like me where I look at the and go, 10 watts? This is going to be really dim, but it's just more efficient, right? It just doesn't have that waste product. In fact, in many places, uh, the old incandescents um, have been outlawed, although there are people still apparently trying to sell them as joint heater slash lights. So oh, this is a very dual function thing. It's a heater and a light. Okay. Um, I should mention, by the way, wattage, of course, if you have a dimmer or it's in the box, it dissipates exactly zero watts. It's not an intrinsic thing of the bulb. When they say these wattages, whatever they say, that's when you're plugging them in how you're supposed to, right? The inherent property is resistance. So they have a certain resistance based on how they're constructed so that when you plug them in under recommended voltage, you'll get a certain power dissipation, right? So the outlet in your wall basically is about 120 volts. So you can use this formula here, P equals V squared over R, 
if you know the, the power that it's claimed on the box, if you know V is 120 volts, you can calculate the resistance of those bulbs. And those, that resistance is their property that is always true, right? Whereas wattage is something where you're plugging in it as recommended and you're not using a dimmer, right? Okay, so um, let's go ahead and build our first circuit and just take these out for a spin. So I'll call these simple circuits. That's my first one. Just going to put a single resistor. Let's just start off. It won't get warmed up. I'm going to say that it's a 12 volt battery. And I'm going to say that the resistance here is 2 ohms. And we're going to pretend that the resistance is entirely in this special resistor. The wires themselves don't uh, add to the problem. Um, they're just a way to extend the equipotential regions. So we have one region here, the battery, and any, the high voltage battery terminal is one voltage plateau. It's extended out by the wire, which we're assuming to be ideal. So that entire thing is the higher voltage plateau, and then we have the lower voltage terminal, the battery, and then we extend the equipotential plateau formed by that, by that piece of wire. So we have that the voltage difference from one end of the, bat the resistor to the other is also 12 volts, right? That's just what the battery is, is uh, causing. So I should tell you what we're solving for. Let's solve for the current that flows and the power dissipation, okay? So let's do it. The current, just use Ohm's law, I equals V over R to solve for the current. We are presenting a motivation of 12 volts to get through this obstruction. So there's a motivation that one end of the resistor is 12 volts lower than the other. We are putting a, two ohms of obstruction in the way we have that 6 amps will flow. So 6 coulombs per second will flow. Okay. And let's calculate the power. Now, we have everything, so it doesn't really matter which of the three power law forms we use. But uh, I guess let me suggest using the last one, just because those were the givens. So I'll use V squared over R. We are applying 12 volts of motivation, and we're putting a 2 ohm obstruction in the way. We get 72 watts. So again, what's a watt? Joule per second. So 72 joules of energy per second are being converted from electrical to uh, heat. Okay. Is that okay so far? All right, let's just swap out, same battery, 12 volts, but let's swap out a, bit, a smaller resistor. Put less in the way, we'll put a one ohm resistor there. I draw it as less squiggly, right? it's easier to get through. Not so much bouncing around. So we can do the same thing and calculate the current, but conceptually you should also already be able to see uh, if we put a smaller obstruction in the way, should we get more current or less? Well, more, right? We're going to get 12 amps of current now. You can solve for that. Of course, since the resistor was half, but the voltage was the same, we actually got twice the current as before. Okay? Makes sense. The motivation from one end to the other is a fixed amount. It's provided by the battery. It's 12 volts. That's your reward from going one into the other, is you get to go to a region that's 12 volts uh, different. But now we put a smaller obstruction, a half a, a obstruction is only half as much, and the current is then therefore twice as much. Let's take a look at the power dissipation. Um, if you solve for this, V squared over R again, we're going to find 144 watts. Okay. Again, because V was the same, but we have the resistance, 
the power was doubled. Which one's going to be brighter, the um, 2 ohm or the 1 ohm, if we, these are light bulbs? 1 ohm. 1 ohm, right? It's going to be brighter. So if you go to the uh, store and you're shopping for the brightest light bulb you can find, you are shopping for the lowest resistance bulb you can find. Okay? The lower resistor will allow more current to flow. And more current to flow across the same voltage difference will be uh, dissipate more energy. So if we go back to the equation, if you want to go back to P equals IV, here's what's happening. We have V is fixed, but because more charges can flow, that means more charges losing the same amount of energy each, right? So when, when we say the battery is 12 volts, that means every charge will lose uh, you will lose 12 joules per every coulomb that flows from one into the other. That is not changing. The voltage is the amount of energy lost per charge. But because there are more of them, because the way is easier, we have more of those charges that are losing 12 joules per coulomb or 12 volts. So we have more total power, power dissipation. Okay. So um, I guess let's go ahead and um, I'm not going to get a chance to hook up anything too complicated today. But I will kind of show you the apparatus. And this is the apparatus we'll be using next time. Um, this right here is a uh, um, car charger. And um, this is going to provide 12 volts across the terminals. Okay. Now, why am I using this? Why don't I just bring in a 12 volt battery? Well, this thing is not going to be, is going to be able to provide whatever I need. It can provide up to 350 amps, okay? So I am not going to run out of the ability for this to provide current, okay? Don't try this at home because 350 amps is lethal, okay? The reason I am using this is because what it turns out is that real power supplies like batteries, they cannot just provide current as much as you need. At some point, they won't be able to keep up. So I'm using this because this is going to behave in the ideal fashion so that we don't have to consider certain more complicated things that we often don't consider in simple, simple problems. So let's hook it up. Um, I'm going to put it on the uh, table here. And you can notice that there are two uh, paddles here, red, higher voltage and black lower voltage, okay? Now, just so everyone can see, what I'm going to do is I'm going to extend those equipotential regions. I'm going to have two stands here like this, put some weights on them just so they stand up. And then I'm gonna connect, I guess I'll flip it around like this, um, just to get a little more reach. I'm gonna connect the red down here and the black here. Now because um, I've connected them to just metal rods, now this means that this entire thing is the higher voltage plateau. Okay? This is all one big equipotential. This is the higher voltage plateau. And then this is all the lower voltage plateau. Okay? So you have to be comfortable with the fact that you're extending these plateaus with contiguous pieces of wire. So this whole thing is the higher voltage. This whole thing is the lower voltage. Okay? So let me get an obstruction in the way. Um, I'll start with this one, so this will be uh, standing in for the 2 ohm, so this is 2 times the resistance of this one, this one, of course, so it's kind of like this, right? I'm not saying they're exactly 2 ohm and 1 ohm, because the currents would be very large, but I'm saying that this one is twice what this one is, so this one is 2R, this one is just R, okay? So they're in the same ratio. So let's connect them up. Um, I'm going to connect them like this. It doesn't really matter where I connect them. I'm just connecting the two plateaus. Okay, and then I'm going to turn on, I uh, uh, haven't uh, turned it on yet. But notice here that the resistance is all actually in the bulb. So the equipotential region, the higher voltage equipotential, is now not only extended all throughout this rod, it's extended all the way right here too. So this is the higher voltage plateau right here. And then this is the lower voltage plateau. Okay, so basically, 
only right in the bulb is there any resistance. So I'll turn it on, and we have light. Okay. And the only way we have of judging that what we're, is going on is correct without any specialized measurement apparatus is just to look at the bulb, its brightness. Okay. So you can look at that. That's pretty bright. Um, it's not going to be that compelling um, when I hook up the other one. So let me point out that th while this is sort of blindingly bright already, you can sort of see the edge of the glass, right? So it's, you, you know if a bulb is really bright, you, you just can't even stand to look at it. But here you can at least see the edge of the glass. So this would be the stand-in for the lower power dissipation. And then I'm going to plug in the lower resistance, this one, and I said that the lower resistance should draw more current uh, and then should be also brighter, more power. So that other one was already pretty blindingly bright, so how much brighter could this one be? So I guess hopefully you'll, you'll believe me that it's brighter, okay? It's hard to tell. Does that sort of look brighter? Not really. Problem with this one too, it has frosted glass, so it kind of tends to be harder to tell. If it didn't have frosted glass, it would blind you slightly more than the other one, which was already blinding, okay? <laughs> um, the reason why I don't have that, um, like, woo, that's not very compelling, but we're going to start hooking up both of these guys uh, together. So there's various configurations where we can connect them together, and then we're going to be able to really tell that there's a difference <coughs> in the brightnesses when we connect them together. So we're going to do two connections. Um, and this, by the way, is going to be the topic of your lab that is week after next, so next, next time Ohm's Law, and then what's called series and parallel circuits. So in the last few minutes here, let me just give you a little bit of a preview where we're going with this. A series circuit is what it sounds like. You have to go, it's like world, world series, right? It's a number of sequential games. So a series circuit is one where in order to get from the highest voltage plateau to the lowest, the journey involves not one, but two different things in a row, okay, like this. Okay, so this is the series circuit. I'll hook it back up again next time, so, uh, but let me point out, let me give you a little bit of a preview. We find a very big difference in the, what is going on with the two, right? Now you, everybody could probably tell there's a difference in the brightness, right? So we'll discuss why that is. So that's a series circuit. So in order to make the journey from top to bottom, you have to go through this and then go through this, right? That's what's called a series. There's another type of circuit, which is called a parallel circuit. So a parallel circuit, it's exactly what it sounds like, like parallel processing in a computer, right? It's many things are being done at the same time. So what a parallel circuit is one where you have multiple options. So what you have is a situation where in order to get from this plateau to this plateau, you can go through this way or go through this way, right? You would, no individual charge would ever go through both of these because why would you go from here to here and then back to here, whoops, why would you just go in a circle? There's no reason to do that, right? If you're leaving the higher voltage to get to the lower voltage, why would you come back through the other resistor to back to where you started? So this is what's called a parallel circuit. Um, and I knocked something loose because now it's not working. No. Okay. So that's called a parallel circuit. And again, if, if they're both blindingly bright here, but you can, if you look carefully, you can tell there is a difference in the brightness of the two. Okay. So again, we'll talk about why that is. Um, so that's where we're going with this, and I'll pick this up um, next time. And uh, the equations that are going to govern, govern the series and parallel stuff, just in case you think, what does this have any relevance to my future career? Um, all the equations for blood flow in the body can be modeled in series and parallel. Okay, so if you take, you know, if you go to med school or something like that, you'll see these again and again. Okay, 
All right, so let's leave it there for today.